Our next speaker, I'm thrilled also to present, uh, he's an assistant professor of operations management in the, uh, the SALT, the SATELS uh, faculty management at McGill University. Uh, his research focuses on the application of predictive analytics and optimization methodologies to improve operational decision in retailing. A self-professed R addict uh, has developed two really important packages that uh, he's actually gonna um, show us today. So please uh, help me welcome Ramnath Vadyanathan. Thanks so much for having me here. And uh, so this is a good talk to be after, right after the IPython talk, because I mean, uh, many of you would have followed like all the nice things that people in Python say about R and people in R say about Python. So, uh, so Jake's kind of really up the ante for me, but I'll try to sort of do my best. Uh, so uh, it's a quick thing, as Irene said, I'm, uh, I'm a professor at uh, Montreal, and my research essentially focuses on retailing, uh, mainly product variety and stuff like that. Uh, so the, re the reason I put this up, so the very first time that I gave a talk on data visualization, uh, so I was basically taking a bus down to New York, and at the border, the I mean, uh, immigration, they asked me questions, so, so what, what do you do? I said, well, I'm a professor, I do operations management and statistics. Uh, what are you gonna talk about? Well, I'm gonna talk about interactive visualizations, the kind that you see in New York Times, and he's like, does this make sense? So basically I got grilled for like half an hour and then he was a good guy. I basically <laughs> spent time uh, explaining to him and then he said, oh, now, now this makes sense. Okay, good, good, have a good talk. So since then I think I've gotten better. So uh, every time at the border I make sure that I, I just convey the right amount of information and uh, I'm good. Uh, so what's my talk about? So my talk is gonna be focused on uh, an R package that I wrote uh, called R charts. And the whole idea of this package is to essentially take what people typically do with R in terms of how people create plots with R, but instead of giving you static plots, essentially giving you interactive plots. So in, in very simple terms, I think Jake's kind of made my, my job really easy. So what Jake's done with MPL uh, and kind of going to D3, I've done the same thing with R charts, okay? With one difference, and I think I want to point out the difference right up front. Uh, Jake has done a really awesome job with writing the JavaScript library that plugs in and essentially ultimately does D3. Uh, I have kind of taken the easy way out because when I started doing D3, I, I was kind of not really comfortable coding uh, that much of JavaScript. So I said, hey, people have already built wrappers on top of D3, like NVD3 and a whole bunch of it. So I essentially piggyback on those libraries. So uh, I don't write a lot of JavaScript code. It's essentially interpreting things that are there, okay? So, so let me kind of quickly get you uh, comfortable with what R charts can do, okay? So in the main difference between how people think about plots in R versus, let's say people think about plots in JavaScript, at least in my mind, is that the primitives are very different, right? So in, in D3, in JavaScript, you build a plot like pretty much point by point, line by line, axis by axis. Uh, but when you do stuff in R, uh, most, most of, how, so how many people here have used R? Uh, just a quick show of hands. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, as you know, in R, you're very used to plotting by just saying, okay, here is X, here is Y, here is my data set, give me the plot I need, okay? So I'm not really bothered about too much about the other things, okay? So, so here is uh, one of the libraries that I uh, plugged into R charts. It's a library called Polycharts. Uh, that's actually based on the grammar of graphics. Too bad that it's not open source. Uh, it's, it's free for uh, non-commercial use. So the idea is to sort of say, okay, so this is a scatter plot where I have a data set uh, called empty cars, which essentially has mileage and weights of cars. So uh, the notation there is saying, oh, give me a plot of miles per gallon versus weight. And you will find these variables in the data set called empty cars. And by the way, I want a plot that has points as the basic type, okay? So once you do that, you see this plot, and uh, I'm not sure if you can see the, at least you can see some kind of a hover, it's very small, but uh, the idea is that this is, this is an interactive uh, plot, it's, it's essentially being, there is JavaScript code that is generating this plot on the floor, okay? Uh, now, once I did this with one library, one of the things I found was that 
uh, and this is uh, and this is something I always puzzle. Every library kind of takes its own tack in terms of data structures, in terms of whether it wants array of objects, object of arrays, wide data, long data. So uh, one of the things I wanted to do was to say, okay, you know what? I think as an as an R user, I don't want to be really exposed to the uh, the finer details. I just want my plot, right? Uh, so basically, I did use the same approach and plugged in a few other libraries. Uh, so this is example uh, from a library called High Charts. Uh, and again, the same idea. So I want a I want a uh, plot of pulse versus height, and the data set is again a built inbuilt data set in R. Uh, but this time, I want to size the points based on age, uh, group them based on exercise, and the type of chart I want is a bubble chart. And these are the title and the subtitle. So once you do this, you get this nice uh, high chart, which, as you can see, uh, uh, for some reason, Reveal JS, JS tends to rescale things. So my plots are much smaller than what I expected them to be, but uh, it's all right. So, uh, so you can see that high charts has like a lot more functionality in terms of what you can do. So you can kind of zoom in and uh, uh, zoom out and all that stuff. And all this you just get for just writing a few lines of code. So this, the high chart binding actually was written by uh, my co-author Thomas, who is in, in Sweden. Uh, and uh, so the basic idea is, as I said, Think in terms of data. Data is the primitives that people working in, in R usually think about. Uh, and then you want an interactive plot with just the same lines of code that you would typically uh, use when you, uh, when you do a static plot. Okay? So I can, I can kind of go on and on about this. That are, uh, and, and initially, I mean, this project started as a hobby project last summer where I was, I was teaching statistics and I wanted to kind of uh, impress my students with some interactive kind of graph. Statistics is not the subject that a lot of people really like. And then once I found that there was a pattern, then it became pretty much an academic quest to sort of say, okay, hey, can I find a library? Can I plug it in? So uh, I think, I think off, uh, as of date, I think I've plugged in uh, close to 10 or 15 libraries, uh, JavaScript libraries, rap wrapper libraries, not D3. Uh, so the idea is that now I can kind of use any one of those libraries to get the plots that I want. So this is a, an example of another library called uh, MorrisJS, which actually does pretty neat uh, time series plots. And, and, and these, packet, these JavaScript libraries allow you more interactivity, uh, like click and other things. But uh, I mean, with a few lines of code, you can pretty much get only the hover and maybe interact kind of behavior. So this is something that uh, is still something that I'm working on. Uh, another library called DimpleJS, which actually is very powerful. Uh, the name is a little unfortunate, but I think uh, the, it's, it's a very powerful library built on top of D3. Okay? So if you go to the R charts website, you will see like, all the libraries that have been integrated. We're in the process of integrating more libraries. And uh, the objective is to let the R user take advantage of all the wonderful work done by JavaScript developers. Uh, and essentially, and also, and interestingly enough, it also provides a community for the people developing JavaScript libraries, it provides another community which uses them. In fact, for some of these, some of these libraries, like Polychart, I think our users uh, filed more uh, GitHub issues than the JavaScript user. So uh, it's kind of interesting to me that uh, it's not just we are kind of taking, but we're also contributing back to the JavaScript community. Uh, now, motivated by that, I, uh, I kind of wrote another package called R Maps, and uh, no guesses here. Takes the same idea. So instead of charts, like can I do interactive maps, right? And, and here again, I mean, I didn't want to kind of get into primitives, so I said, okay, let's look at the libraries that already exist. So there is Leaflet, uh, which does really uh, neat maps. So uh, I'm, I'm just gonna quickly uh, rush through the code here. Uh, so this is just in instantiating a Leaflet object, setting a lat long, uh, choosing a provider. Uh, I, I like st statements, watercolor maps. And uh, then I want a marker. And then finally, I'm saying print the map. And then you get a map like this. And uh, you, can, you can point on it. Uh, and, and R Maps exposes you to the full API of what Leaflet, or pretty much everything that Leaflet exposes you to, uh, R Maps tries to expose uh, uh, people to that. Uh, another one of my favorite examples. Uh, so uh, and, and so many, many of these examples came about because of kind of fishing expeditions. Uh, so, for example, I was looking at a library called Crosslet, which is a combination of Crossfilter and Leaflet. Okay, and does some really nifty things. So I said, ah, this is a really nice JavaScript library that can be used uh, to visualize spatial data. Okay, 
So the data set I'm using here is actually a data set from visualizing.org. It's a data set that has web indices uh, on multiple dimensions across countries. Okay. So uh, what I'm saying here is, look, I mean, I always tend to think of pretty much any plot as like an x, y. Uh, I know that it's probably not the best way to do it, but it simplifies my life. Uh, so here I'm saying, okay, the x variable I want you to think about is the country. The y variable, I want these four variables to be plotted. And the data set where you'll find these variables is web index. And uh, I want you to render it using crosslet. So once I do that, and uh, actually this particular one, I think it's, it's more fun uh, executing it uh, live. So uh, let me just go down to this. Okay. So uh, I'm just going to execute this. And as you can see here, OK. Let's see one second. OK, so I have the plot here. OK, there you go. So, so here you have a, you have a, a, you have a choropleth. And of course, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of data missing. And the nice thing is that you have all these uh, numerical variables on the top where you can actually filter and by multiple variables, and you can see uh, which countries kind of have indices in these ranges. right? And uh, Crosslet, I mean, bulk of the work is done by Crosslet. So as I said, I don't write a lot of JavaScript code. Uh, I study the JavaScript code that is written by other people and basically provide an interface from R where I try to think about, okay, how would somebody dealing with data think about this plot? And the way I would think about this plot is, okay, there are some numerical variables, uh, there is a country variable, and uh, essentially that's basically what's going to give me the plot. Okay, let me get back to this. Uh, so this is crosslet. Uh, now, you can also do custom uh, uh, visualizations. Uh, I'll, I'll get into this uh, a little later. Okay? Okay. Now, just creating visualizations is not sufficient. Being able to share visualizations is extremely critical. Right? And, uh, and, and here's, a, here's, a, here's my rationale. Usually, whenever you want a tool to be used by people, you want to make sure that it doesn't change their workflows too much. Right? That's the best way to get people to use a tool. So if I think about how people in R typically use, uh, use R, I mean, when they do static plots, they don't have to kind of jump through hoops to share things, right? Because images, static images are easy uh, to kind of have in the document. But when it comes to interactive visualizations, it's not the same case, right? There are a lot of dependencies. You have JavaScript assets, you have CSS assets, you have data, you have all these kind of things, right? Now, it's not terribly complicated to kind of ship everything when you share, but the e but easier you make it, uh, people are going to be more likely to use it. So that's the design principle that I always use when I uh, design uh, packages uh, of this kind, where I say, OK, I really want to make sure that it doesn't deviate on people's workflows. Okay? So, so here is, a, again, a simple uh, chart. It's actually a, 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 a multi-bar chart. Uh, so I'm just writing the code to create the multi-bar chart. Uh, now, there are many mechanisms that people want to share their uh, visualizations, right? So one is just a simple save. Uh, so the, here the idea is that I'm just taking the plot I created, and I'm just saying, OK, save it. And uh, you will see there is an argument called CDN equals true, which is saying, OK, you know what? Uh, don't link to the local library on my machine, but link all the JS CSS assets from an online repository. Okay? So uh, that's essentially what it does. Okay? Now, I thought that this would solve the issue. Uh, because, I mean, these assets are online, so when somebody shares it, it's going to be fine. But there is a problem, right? So a lot of times when I link to something online, and for example, in this case, uh, NVD3, they decided to change the links to some of their JavaScript assets. And somebody who was using our charts, they were giving a talk. Uh, one day it was working, the chart was working. The very next day the chart wasn't working, and nothing changed, right? So, uh, so, so then this kind of prompted me to do something a little different, where I, had, I added another option called standalone, where the idea is that the entire chart and the JavaScript assets, the CSS assets, everything is going to be bundled into one single standalone page. Okay? So uh, 
it's it's a it's a it's a lot of, uh, I mean, if you look at the HTML, it's really ugly because what it does is it converts everything to data URIs. Uh, but the nice thing is that, I mean, this HTML people can share without really having to worry about um, things breaking um, for, for anybody. Okay? Now, one of the things that Jake was talking about was this whole notion of reproducibility. Right? And I think reproducibility is really critical. Uh, so a lot of times, I'm not just interested in sharing the chart. I'm also interested in sharing the code that came with the chart. And I want to maintain things in sync. Okay? Now, there are two ways to maintain things in sync. One way to maintain things in sync is what uh, Jake talked about, which is the, uh, which is the good old uh, IPython notebooks. Okay? The other way, for those of you who are uh, more uh, proficient in R and kind of more comfortable with R, uh, you would know that R Studio uh, has uh, a format called R Markdown. Okay, and essentially what R Markdown does is uh, let me just increase the font size so that you can see things better. Okay. So, so what R Markdown does is it allows you to mix code with allows you to mix code with the end product. Okay, so it's just like IPython notebooks. In fact, there's a lot of similarities between the two, uh, to the extent that it's actually possible to automatically convert an R Markdown notebook to an IPython notebook, and I, you, I do that quite a lot. Uh, so, for example, the slide deck that you just saw, uh, where I showed you the high charts plot, uh, it, this code is live in the document. Okay, so which means that if I change this code and I execute it, my slides will change automatically. Uh, now, you can do the same thing with IPython notebooks, too. Uh, and, and of course, uh, you, to, you want to make, make things really simple for people to use again. As I said, that's the uh, objective. Uh, so for example, if I wanted to show the same plot in an, in an R notebook, uh, I would essentially use the show method and basically embed it as an iframe uh, and then choose things to be uh, delivered from a CDA. Okay? So uh, these are a couple of other, other ways to kind of share the same plot. You could inline the iframe, a uh, whole bunch of things. Okay? Now, uh, some, sometimes you just want to kind of share a quick prototype. Right? You don't want to kind of go through the process of like saving and then shipping, emailing. Uh, and so here, again, I, I'm very inspired by uh, people who built other packages. So uh, Mike, I think D3, one of the very good things about D3 is this whole thing that you could publish to gists, and you could really view things amazingly, right? I mean, and th I think it's really triggered a uh, movement where people share examples and uh, can easily take advantage of things. Uh, so now I wanted to do the same thing with, uh, with uh, R charts. So basically provide people with a, with, with a function that would allow them to publish their charts online, okay? So let me again just do a quick uh, demo of this. Uh, so let me just make sure that I uh, have this code here. So this code, all that it does is it just creates a chart. OK, so I'm going to run this code. OK, so my plot is good. So now all that I'm going to do is, if I want to publish this, I'm just going to invoke the publish method and say, OK, hair versus my color. And so what it's doing in the back end is it, it's using uh, our package called HTTR, and it's saving the HTML and pushing it to the gist, and it returns a link to, uh, to a viewer that I kind of borrowed uh, from uh, open source code online. And so now you have the, you have the chart show up here. Okay. Uh, now in this case, I only shipped the uh, I only shipped the plot. I didn't ship the code with the plot. Okay, uh, I could do a live demo on that, but uh, I just want to make sure that I uh, I wrap my talk wrap up my talk in time. So uh, if you shipped it with code, it's very easy to ship it with code. Uh, if you shipped it with code, then what happens is that uh, it allows you the viewer allows you to actually play with allows other people to play with the code online. Okay, so this this is kind of very very similar model very similar to uh, Mike, Mike's blocks. So the only difference is that in the case of blocks, people want to see the HTML code. Uh, in the case of R charts, I believe people want to see the R code because that's what's generating everything. Right? Uh, so now, if I, I, I built a, a functionality, you can't, you can't see things here, but uh, that's all right. So what it's doing is it's essentially opening this up in a web app. 
So it's an R-based web app, which I will talk about uh, in a few minutes. And the nice thing is that it allows people to play with code without really having R charts installed on their computer. Okay? So in this case, for example, if everything is good, it should show up the plot. Yeah. So you see the very same plot being uh, built online as what you saw there. So the whole idea is that there's an ecosystem where people can publish their code with their plots, and somebody can just directly go there, either copy the code to their R session, or I mean, they don't want to do that, just play with things. They could hit the edit button, and it essentially takes them to that. Okay. So, uh, so the main point I wanted to make here is that when when building tools of this kind, I think being able to create is one thing, but also being able to share and making it really easy to share, especially for people who are typically used to sharing static assets. Uh, I think is, is really key. And the simpler you make it, uh, the more people are going to use it. Okay? So this is as far as embedding goes. Uh, now, I, I will talk more about this in, in, in just a bit. But uh, you can also do the same thing in IPython notebooks. So I'll talk about the IPython R kernel, which was built recently, which actually provides you another way to build self-contained, fully reproducible, dynamic, interactive documents. Okay? But again, these are only the means, right? Both IPython notebooks and R Markdown are the means to do it. Uh, they provide you a very nice way to kind of tie things up. Okay. Uh, now, we have talked about, we just talked about creating charts. Uh, now, what about customizing them, right? So you want to basically do more where, uh, with the same chart. So, uh, so here's an example of a scatter plot that I had showed, shown you before. In this case, only difference is that I'm coloring the points based on the number of gears. Uh, now, suppose I want to add an interactive control to this chart where I want to let the user dynamically pick the x-axis variable. Right? Now, there are multiple ways to do this. One way that was shown yesterday where uh, Sam, when he talked about MVC frameworks, he talked about how you could use Angular, uh, Ember, Backbone to really uh, create, create this. Right? So again, I'm going to, I'm going to do a live, live demo of this to, uh, to show you what, what can be done. So, so here, all that I'm doing is I'm creating, creating the chart, and so you have the chart here. Okay. Now, suppose I want to add an interactive control, right? So I want to add an interactive control, and here is what I want to do with the control. I want the control to essentially control the x variable. Uh, I want to initialize the x variable to weight, and I want the control to populate, be populated with all the column names from this data set called empty cars. So let me run this. And now if I, if I print this plot, you will see that it has added a interactive control on the, on the left side. Okay? Now, this is completely client side. This is completely client side, which means that I, I could just take this HTML, ship it off, just making sure that the assets are all linked online. Uh, now, what's happening in the back end is that it's actually writing AngularJS code. Okay? So I will just show you the source. It's, it's probably the most unidiomatic JavaScript, so please don't judge me on this. It's like how what happens when an R uh, programmer writes JavaScript. So you can see all these, uh, you can see these controllers over here. Okay? So what, what I did with R charts, I basically said, okay, now when you think about a control, I want to specify the bare minimum set of things. Right? And what's a bad minimum set of things I need to specify? I just need to say, OK, here is the variable I want to control. Here is what I want you to put in that variable. And here, is the, uh, here are the options I want you to kind of add to it. Okay? Uh, now, you can, you can do, you can do, more, uh, you can do more, uh, more with this. Let me actually show you an example uh, with this here. Uh, so sometimes you, uh, you want to be able to, okay, let me just change this. Give me a second. Sometimes you also want to be able to do data manipulation in the in the back, in the front end. Uh, so, uh, so in this case, for example, I have a I have a bar chart, okay, and in, I, I want to add a filter, okay. Essentially, what the filter does is it allows me to switch between males and females in the data set. So now, if I uh, if I run this whole plot, uh, you'll see that it's added it's added a, a box here. Now, of course, uh, you, there is overlapping bars here. So I haven't figured out the way to kind of summarize it automatically. But if I switch to female or male, you will see that the data is actually getting filtered. Now, all this is happening on the client side. Uh, so what's happening is that uh, R is writing uh, Lodash code, which actually does all this stuff. Okay? Now, before you think that this is kind of like a clean translation from R to JavaScript, 
which I hope you're not thinking about it. Uh, this is very hacky. The whole idea is to identify the primitives, which I again said. And so there's a lot of templating involved here. OK? OK, so let me now sh quickly show you what, how, how R charts works. OK? And, and I think this is kind of important because it will show you how, what happens in the background and why I believe that uh, this approach can actually be ported to other languages. And then essentially, like, it makes things, I mean, R, Python, everybody can coexist peacefully, right? Which is, which is what I always want. Uh, so here is a simple example of uh, a library called UV charts. That's again a wrapper on top of uh, D3. Okay, and I've just this is actually the actual JavaScript chart. Now, if you kind of break this JavaScript plot into multiple pieces, uh, I'm sure you can't read that over here. But essentially, what it's saying here is that these are the assets being used by the plot. Okay, so. So what I do is I have a config file in, in, in our charts where the config file says, OK, these are the plots that I want to be. These are the files I want to be using for my JavaScript and CSS. Okay? Now, uh, the, going to the actual JavaScript code, if you look at it, this is the actual JavaScript code that uh, writes the plot. Now, if you think about JavaScript uh, code, I tend to think about it in two parts. One is, what's the data and what's boilerplate? Okay, and essentially, what you want to do is you don't want the user to worry about the boilerplate. Okay? Uh, so what I've done here is I've abstracted it out to a template. Uh, I use mustache templates. Uh, and so my reason for choosing mustache is a logicless templating framework. And pretty much every language has support for mustache. Right? And, so I, and this is something I consciously made a choice because I really wanted to be able to do this in Python, Ruby, and other languages. So now this is the data set. And here is the pain point that's always, in fact, when I look back to all the code I wrote, most of the code that I wrote is to translate between a data frame, which is the standard in R, uh, to a choice of JSON that the developer of a particular library makes. Okay? And you'll be amazed at like, the range. People choose all different kinds of data structures, wide, long, array of objects, named, I mean, it's a whole gamut of things. And I believe that standardizing some of that, I think, will really make things simpler. Okay, so for example, just assuming that people are going to use a d3.csv or a d3.json to read in the data, I think will simplify things a bit. Okay? So there is the code here. So what this code does is it just does the transformation from the data to the JSON. Okay? So once I do that, all that I have to do now is to wrap this code into, uh, into an interface. Okay, and I'll quickly go over the interface. So what I'm doing here is I'm instantiating a new object of the R charts class. Uh, I'm setting the library to UV charts, which is actually a folder that contains all of this. And then I'm setting a few things. I want a bar chart. Uh, I want my categories to be the names in the data set. Uh, this is the data set, and I want you to put it in the DOM element called chart one. Okay. So once I do this, I have I have this plot. Okay, now I can make things even simpler by wrapping it into a, co a piece of code called uvplot, where now the user doesn't have to worry about any of the conversions internally. As far as the user goes, switching from one library to another is seamless. Right? Now, why would anyone want to do that? Well, uh, what I've seen is that I always find features in one library that I like, which I don't find in the other library for certain things. So I keep switching between libraries for the kind of plots that I want. Okay? So now you have a UV plot functionality, and now people just have to plug in their x, y, and other things. Okay. Okay. So now, so far I've shown you simple, simple plots. You can also do uh, you can also do pretty complicated plots using all this. Okay. So uh, now I kind of debated between doing this in uh, R Markdown versus IPython Notebook. Uh, finally decided that okay, maybe I should do it in the IPython Notebook. Uh, so, so this is actually a recreation of uh, New York Times had a, a chart on strikeouts, uh, where uh, strikeouts across the years, right? So let me uh, let me just execute uh, all the cells here. Hopefully, nothing nothing fails. And uh, so, so one of the things you can see here is so what, I, what I, all that I'm doing here is I'm using a data set that's built into our call uh, Lehman that has all these databases. So the data is built in. Uh, and I am essentially using uh, the grammar of graphics available in polycharts. Okay? So you can see, uh, uh, I, I will publish these IPython notebooks so you can take a deeper look at it. 
So for example, what I'm doing here is I'm just creating a first layer that's consisting of points where it's strikeouts per game versus year with a tooltip. Okay? Uh, now, I want to add a line. If you remember the New York Times uh, interactive, there is a line that shows the means of every single, uh, every single uh, year. Okay? Now, that's pretty easy to do here. All that I'm doing here is uh, I'm, I'm kind of specifying another layer. Uh, and let's say, uh, just to show you that this is kind of dynamic, uh, you can see that uh, uh, it's, it's actually, actually drawing on top of the previous layer. Okay? Uh, so I'm drawing a line, and uh, I'm, I'm, everything else is copied from the previous layers. Uh, now finally, let's say the team, I actually I had it as Boston Red Sox. Uh, I changed it at the last minute, so let me just change it here again. Okay. Uh, although I might have to re-execute the entire notebook. Just give me one second, because uh, the layers are all... Okay, there you go. So now you have another uh, line added, which shows you only stuff for the... Uh, Boston Red Sox. Okay, now, uh, now if you remember the New York Times interactive, it was not just showing you one particular uh, team, right? You could choose what teams you wanted, and uh, so Jake kind of spent a lot of time talking about the IPython interactive features. Uh, now, for R, uh, there is an amazing web framework uh, built by the guys from our studio called Shiny that allows you to do pretty much the same thing. Uh, and actually, it allows you to do a lot more, uh, at least in terms of features I've seen. It allows you to do a lot more. Uh, and so, so all that I've done here is I've just wrapped this whole thing up into a function called plot team, which basically takes the team's name and uh, creates the plot that you want. Okay? Now, all that I want to do to make this a web app is I want a drop-down menu that has the team names. And then when I switch the names there, it should basically give me the correct, uh, correct plot. Okay? So, uh, so to make sure that I'm not kind of putting everything in the dropdown, I'm just select, selecting a threshold where uh, I want the teams to have appeared at least 30 times. Uh, it's an arbitrary threshold. You can change it. And now, this is essentially Shiny. Okay? Now, what Shiny does is Shiny allows you to specify a UI and a server. So in this case, the UI is written completely in R, where I want to just add a, add a, a interactive dropdown menu. and uh, And so this is the UI, and the uh, my let me just write this piece of code here. Uh, and what I want is on the output side, I essentially want it to plot the team. Okay, but I don't want the team to be hard coded. I want the team name to be picked up from the input side. Okay, so in this case, I just want plot team input dollar team. So. Essentially, the way uh, Shiny is a reactive framework, just like Angular, only difference is that it's basically completely uh, R-based. Uh, so now if I, let me just make sure this is good. Okay. Okay, if everything goes right, I should get the stuff. So now you see, so this is actually a Shiny R application. And if I, if I select a different team here, Chicago Cubs, you can see that the plot changes. Okay? Now, the main difference I want to point out in terms of interactivity is that uh, this one is kind of happening on the server side. The previous thing I showed you was happening completely on the client side. Here, whenever somebody is clicking on the dropdown and picking a different team, it's actually running back to the R server and saying, hey, uh, the guy has changed the team, so just give me a, another plot. Okay? So we are actually recreating multiple plots, pretty much like what the IPython notebook does. Okay? So uh, if you want to learn more, there is a lot of uh, stuff. There is a gallery on our charts here. Uh, and I'm constantly looking for ideas for libraries to incorporate. Uh, so this, again, actually uh, thanks to Chris View, who built this website for D3 and uh, allowed me to share the same code uh, base for uh, my gallery. Okay. So um, I think uh, I'm out of time. So uh, thank you so much. If you have questions, I'll be happy to take questions. And uh, Irene, feel free to stop me when I'm need to leave the stage. <laughs> <laughs>